welcome back to A Mindful Moment. I hope everyone's doing well. How are you, Melissa? <sighs> I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I know you've been in a lot of training this week. Yes, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> well, I thought today, because May is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, that maybe mental health is a good topic for us to discuss today. And especially in thinking about how mindfulness can help with mental illness and what mindfulness cannot do um, because it's not a cure-all, right? It can't cure mental illness, but it's very effective uh, from a couple of perspectives, preventative and in reducing symptoms and in sort of partnership with professional uh, therapies that a person may be getting. So I thought we could just kind of touch on that today. Yeah. Um, before we get into this, I have to I have to give a disclaimer. We are not doctors. No. So this is not medical advice. This is really coming from, you know, an educational perspective about mindfulness. And so, you know, if you ever have any concerns about your health or your mental health, you should of course contact a professional um, service provider so for your health so that you uh, get the help that you need. Mental illness is a health issue. And Mental Health Awareness Month. I didn't know this, but it started in 1949. I didn't think they ever talked about mental health, you know, before 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I read that when I was uh, researching for a blog I'm writing about mental health. I, I read that as well, and I was pretty surprised. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the original motivations for declaring it uh, Mental Health Month is not just awareness, but because there's such a stigma around mental illness. And um, I think it's gotten a lot better. But I still think there is stigma around it. And I think maybe even more so for men, they don't want to say that they have a mental illness. Um, women are more open to it because we're just more open about sharing personal vulnerable details. But I think there is still some stigma. And the problem with that is that it prevents people from getting help. Um, I think, uh, interestingly, even though maybe where we live uh, in California, there is not as much of a stigma, but I think it really depends on where you live. Yeah. Uh, some of the research I was doing was talking about how the states with the highest rates of untreated mental health issues, a lot of them are in the Midwest and the South. I don't know the reasons for that, but I, there may be a little bit more of a stigma around mental health in those areas. I do think that uh, it's getting better, but there are a lot of places where it really has not changed much. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I would also, I don't want to say people may be in denial, but people may not be aware that they are suffering from a mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not even about stigma. They're just not aware, which is, of course, one place mindfulness comes in. But um, over 50 million Americans suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in any given year. And that's about one in four adults. So that's really prominent. There's a lot of people suffering and I found it really interesting that over half don't ever get treatment. And that kind of made me sad because it just means people are suffering and they don't even realize they could feel better. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's cultural? Do you think it's not understanding that it truly is a health issue? Do you think it's not in a negative way, but not being educated about mental health issues, period? I think it's probably a combination, but I think another big factor is insurance. Mm. because a lot of insurance doesn't cover or they cover five, you know, five therapy sessions or something. Right. So this is like dental. Okay. I know this drives me crazy. Okay. Yeah. Our teeth are part of our bodies. Okay. Right. They right. should be just as covered as the I rest agree. of our bodies. Our brain drives our body. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I know it needs it, to be covered. Yeah. It's, <sighs> it's ludicrous. Um, but then again, you know, we talk about trying to remove the stigma, but part of the stigma comes from the fact that, oh, well, it's not fully covered by insurance, or, so it must not be a, an important deal. So I think that that could also contribute to it. I also found it interesting that the delay between symptom onset and the first treatment for mental illness is approximately 11 years. So again, a person realizes oh. they don't feel good, but they don't do anything about it for a decade. So. That's what today is about. It's like just becoming more aware um, that, first of all, many, many people suffer from mental illnesses. Some are brief, like as, as little as two weeks, and others could last a lifetime. But there's a lot of different options. I was going to say, too, I think another reason people may not seek 
out like therapy or counseling is because for so long antidepressants were so over prescribed right if you went into a doctor and you said i'm really feeling sad or whatever they'd say here take this you'll feel better there's so many people now who don't want to take prescription medication that i think maybe some of them just rule it out it's like no they're just going to try to give me a pill and i don't want a pill yeah i think it's also am i just sad or am i depressed you know we're not being able to identify self-diagnose right where it's like yes. am i just sad right now am i going to get through this and then it starts to just snowball into five years later, I'm still feeling the same way and I haven't gotten any help. Beyond Blue, mm -hmm. they are mental health providers in Australia. But um, I found this maybe a useful, we can talk too about symptoms to watch for, but they created a, a mental health continuum, which is a very simple five phase continuum. So like healthy is where you start, right? You're, you're in the healthy phase. And then the second phase is being unsettled. So if you feel unsettled, okay, that doesn't mean you have a diagnosable mental illness. It means it's the onset of something that you want to be mindful about, pay attention to it. So being unsettled would be when you, it's like, I just don't feel like myself, right? It's a change. Something's happened, even though there may be no external reason for it to have happened. So you might be irritable, like I have been lately, um, irritable or having trouble concentrating or not knowing why you're feeling that way. So those, those are some hints for you. If you pay attention to them, like, oh, what's going on? You might feel worried more than usual or restless, frustrated. You might have mood fluctuations. And this is one of the challenges with mental illness. That could also describe someone in starting their menstrual cycle or yeah. someone being really tired, right? So it doesn't mean necessarily, of course, it's always up to you, but it doesn't mean you necessarily need to pick up the phone and call and get a therapist right then. It means start paying attention to these feelings if you're having any thoughts like negative thoughts that you can't seem to get them to stop kind of swirling in your head things like that um then that's the the, the you want to step in and say okay what do i need to do what action can i take to see if it makes a difference and we'll talk more in a few minutes about mindful uh practices that you can do that would help it like in this exact kind of situation but another thing may be just talk to a friend about it really I'm really feeling blah all of a sudden yeah, or yeah. Um, maybe that's the time to check out online therapy like you're not committing to a long-term relationship with a therapist but you know maybe I'll have a session and see if if that makes a difference um, if you have a minister or a priest or a rabbi or someone like that you know you might talk to them but it's just where you're aware something has shifted in your emotional and mental state and you don't want to let it spiral you want to make sure okay, maybe I need to do something. And then again, of course, if there's external things going on, you know, I, I always call for myself, it's an event-based issue. Something has happened, which is like, I'm irritable right now. It was funny because when I was reading this, I'm like, oh gosh, I have these symptoms. <laughs> but it's, it's because I've had a very irritating week and I'm now tired. And as you know, I'm going to take a couple of days off because I can feel it coming. And so that's another uh, really important just tip is self-care is critical in this. Um, yeah, I could push myself and keep going and be really cranky by Saturday. I'm not going to do that. I want to take a little breather and see if that corrects the problem because I, I suspect it will. So it's a wide range of uh, complex issues that cause mental illness. And no one knows exactly why. It could be genetic. It could be environmental. It could be past experience. I mean, there's just so many layers to it. But it's likewise with the symptoms. It's not like a clear bell goes off to say, hey, you're starting to suffer from depression. Yeah, right? it's not like you got a runny nose and you know you're sick. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So then on the uh, Beyond Blue continuum, the third phase is struggling. Struggling slash crisis. So it's kind of two in one. Um, but struggling is just what it sounds like. Are you, are you suddenly having trouble doing your normal daily activities? Are you having trouble sleeping? Struggling, struggling, right? So it's like you can, it starts to feel like life is getting hard. And that's another sign. And again, depending on how you feel, and it's always gonna be, and this is why mindfulness is so important. It's about being very aware of your emotions, your feelings, feeling it in your body. You can probably tell if yeah. it's at that point that it's time to call for help. It may not be. We all go through periods of struggle, right? So if you know, if you know why you're struggling, then you can probably practice some more self-care, mindfulness, try to help yourself work out of it. If you don't know why you're struggling, I, to me, that would be my indicator. 
if everything's fine and I'm struggling, it's internal, yeah. is my, my opinion. But that's really what I think. And certainly what I've uh, experienced myself is, what the heck? You know, and then I, I, of course, do use mindfulness and meditation to explore what's going on. But if you're at that point, keep in mind that the next part of that phase is crisis. Mm -hmm. And, and that's that where, like? so that's where you're really having like uh, continuous negative thoughts that you can't control. You cannot perform a lot of your daily activities. You don't enjoy things in life that you typically have enjoyed in the past. Um, you're lethargic. Maybe you don't sleep well, or maybe you want to sleep all the time. Your diet may change. So it's really where there are physiological and mental behaviors and processes that have changed pretty dramatically from your nor quote normal self, you know, for however you typically are. And that is really when it's highly recommended that you reach out for support because again, one in four Americans are going to have a mental illness in any given year. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be something horrific to deal with. It just means you've got to take the steps to start changing it. That's kind of hard because if you think about, I think like you said, if, if you're paying attention to external events, and it's unrelated because you could be going through grief. You could be going through some of these stages where those things are probably going to happen. And that could be temporary. May not be, but it could be. And so trying to like delineate, is this an illness? Is this event related is super important. But I think because we are really experiencing a global mental health crisis at this point, that just paying really acute attention to how you're feeling the way I think of it is in terms of, I could feel great. So what's preventing me from feeling great? Yeah. And if it's something that I can't identify or do something about, then I'm going to pick up the phone and call to make an appointment. And maybe you don't call a therapist right away. Maybe you call, you know, your just general doctor, your GP or your internist or something, because physical ailments can also create mood disorders. Mm -hmm. And so because it's so complex, I mean, I wouldn't rely on myself if I really couldn't figure it out fairly quickly. I wouldn't think, oh, I'll just Google it and figure this out. I think I would call a professional because I don't want to suffer. <laughs> yeah. There's, you know, I, I want to feel good. And so, I mean, I think that that is um, a large part of the goal. The other thing, though, is that there are things we can do with mindfulness and meditation that, that are preventative. What popped into my head at the top of the list was mindful eating. Because we are image conscious, a lot of the times we always associate diet and nutrition and exercise with looking good and, mm -hmm. and maybe feeling good, but a lot of people are very focused on looking good, which it does, that does help. But I don't know if many people correlate what we put in our mouth is the fuel for our brain, not just our body. I was going to say that when you were, when you brought up the fact that, you know, maybe you're eating more or less than you used to paying attention to what you're putting in your body, the effect that food has on your brain yeah. is just as much as it has on your the rest of your body if not more yeah and that it can greatly affect how you think how you feel how much you can focus so many things it's pretty incredible it popped into my head years and years ago i wrote a blog about comparing how much better we take care of our cars mm -hmm. than our bodies mm -hmm. and so you know like put the premium gas in and we make sure the tires are perfect and we make sure the lights are clean. You know, we do all these things with a car. And the reason it popped into my head is because I think the image I used or the analogy I used was you wouldn't pour a cup of sugar into your gas tank. Why? Because you know it's going to destroy something in your car. I, I don't even know. I know it's bad. I don't know what it does. But sugar is one of the biggest problems for our brains. Mm -hmm. When we consume a diet high in refined sugar, it directly impacts the brain because it affects our insulin levels. Um, it creates this scenario in the brain where our body and brain can't uh, get rid of the excess, the oxidization, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it can't clean it out. And that, that's free radicals. So sugar prevents our system that works so well to get rid of free radicals, which of course can cause cancer. It stops that process. Can't, it can't deal with it. So it's like pouring sugar in your gas tank. And I want to point out too, to those listeners out there that are like, oh, I don't have sugar. I, everything I eat is diet. That's almost worse because aspartame and yeah. sucralose have massive effects on your nervous system. 
Yeah. So this is when people will start to get tremors and things like that. Like it's just as bad. Like we need to just yeah. maybe disassociate our wonderful relationship with sugar. <laughs> well, yeah. And all refined foods. I mean, mm -hmm. so basically our, our brains need vitamins, minerals, I mean, all, you know, every healthy nutritional thing you can think of. And Western diets are full of processed foods, high fats, high sugar, high salt. So you're not just increasing your blood pressure or risking kidney disease or something like that or, or diabetes you're damaging the brain. I mean, that's a harsh way to say it, but it's really true. It damages the brain. Whereas if you uh, look at the Mediterranean diet, the Japanese diet, the DASH diet, all of those are designed to give you the highest impact in nutrition while minimizing those things that cause damage. And they did a study or they've done several studies to show that those diets, I'm mentioning those three, I'm sure there are others with other names that are the same philosophy of like, you know, uh, reduced red meat, more fish, more vegetables, more fruit, good oils. But they've shown that um, just eating one of those healthy diets can reduce your risk of depression by up to 35%. Wow. Just, just food. So I think mindful eating is one of the areas that could have a big impact on your emotional well-being and on your mental health because you're giving the brain the nutrition that it needs. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of food, we are, as a society, very focused on heart health. We're focused on, you know, physical structure health as far as our bones and muscles and fat. Uh, but a lot of those areas of our body are repairable. The brain is not as repairable as the rest of the body. I mean, mindfulness obviously is amazing to me because it can, it can boost our health, overall health by so much, and it can add years to our lives, just practicing mindfulness and meditation. But again, one more time, what it can't do is cure a mental right. illness. Now there is a big benefit to practicing mindfulness, which again is awareness, it's just paying attention to what you're doing, but it does help us become more aware of our thoughts and feelings. We tend to ignore a lot of those thoughts and feelings in our day-to-day -day busyness. So the more mindful you are, the more alert you are to any kind of shift in thoughts or feelings. It's also been shown to uh, reduce or to help with negative feelings related to loneliness or isolation, which many people are now. Uh, that's another big problem in society. And again, this is global, but especially in the, in the West, a lot of it's because of social media. People are just, they're staying alone and they are interacting only with a device. And so that causes depression over time. Meditation has been shown to improve overall mental health. There are specific meditations for specific ailments, but basically mindfulness and meditation can help us cope with rejection, which is another area that we're so sensitive now. And it's like, we don't want to be rejected by anyone. And so that can help us expand that out. And then it's been effective for people with health conditions like hypertension, chronic pain, and heart failure. And typically when you have any of those conditions, like you were just discussing, because they're serious, we tend to get depressed. And if we stay depressed too long, it becomes a mental illness, not just a temporary kind of sadness. So just practicing mindfulness and meditation and mindful eating, mindful walking. I mean, there's so many things that you can do. So if you feel great right now, why not do those things? That It's like a resiliency or, or a, a barrier to slow down some of the destruction that we do to our bodies through our other behaviors. <laughs> yeah. And, and like you said, the tools that we're talking about are obviously, if, if you're suffering from a more severe mental illness, they're not going to be something that's going to cure you at all. Even if you aren't sure if you need to see a doctor, I would see one. They're not going to laugh at you. They're not going to say, oh, please. They're not going to yeah. do that. There's nothing wrong with going to see a doctor if you're not sure. And if it's if it turns out to be something not serious, wonderful. Yeah. But if it turns out to be something serious, then look, you went and you took took advantage of it and now you're getting help. I was getting close to feeling like I was going to, that I needed to call a therapist toward the end of the shutdowns. I could feel myself getting more and more depressed. And I bring this up because I said earlier, you know, if, it's, if there's an external event going on and you know what's causing it, then, you know, you're probably safe. But that popped into my head while you were talking. There are exceptions to that. So in that case, I am just not built for sitting still, being isolated, being, you know, I am a run around, do things kind of person. And that, that massive feeling of restriction just impacted my mental health. And I knew it, and it was an external event. So I kept saying, okay, as soon as this is over, I'll be fine. But it went on too long. 
And I was really at the point of thinking, okay, I, I think I need to call a therapist because my depression is getting worse and worse just about the time things opened up. And then sure enough, I started feeling, I didn't bounce right back though. <laughs> so I probably still could have benefited from therapy, but maybe it, there is an external, like you brought up grief. If, if the grief is going on long enough that you feel like you can't function and, it, and it's just getting to the point that you're you know, miserable or so uncomfortable over time, then why not? get some yeah. help and how to process things. Like I had that. that situation when I was younger, I was, gosh, I think I was 19 or 20 terrible breakup. I could not get out of the depression and I ended up seeing a doctor and they prescribed me with an antidepressant. And I also have depression that runs in my family. So you just don't know, you know, I was kind of like, well, is this going to be something that's long-term? And is this just the beginning of it? Or is this just temporary because of the breakup? I didn't know. Uh, I took the medication. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> it just wasn't for me, wasn't for my body. And after about a month, I felt better and I stopped taking it and I was fine. Yeah. But had I not gone to go see a doctor, I could have been in that, you know, misery for a lot longer. And I'm glad I went, even though it wasn't for me, I'm glad I went. And I'm glad that they, you know, they figured it out and helped me get through it. I did the same when I went through the divorce. I, I realized I wasn't handling it well. So I went and saw a therapist. And again, I think one of the reasons people don't seek out therapy is because they hear the myths of, oh, it takes 10 years to resolve a problem or, you know, that's not really true. Um, in my case, I used my employer assistance program. So an EAP. So if you work for any sizable company, they probably have an EAP. I started there. And then I was referred to a psychiatrist to prescribe um, and it was anti-anxiety medication. And same thing, I, it was about a month and I'm not, I know that's where you get it from. I'm not good with medication. <laughs> so I was like, no, this is, this is not helping me. But what did help me was talking to somebody about it kind of, it's not that they normalized it, but it gave me that perspective of, you know, a lot of people go through this and it's not the end of the world. And I am gonna be able to figure out what my life looks like now. So just that boost. So you know, I mentioned on that continuum, you know, in the early stages, sometimes just talking to a friend. In my case, there were so many, like, just, I don't know, stressful things happening at once that I had a hard time even talking to a friend. I really needed a professional. Um, but a lot of times, you can talk to a friend or, you know, talk to, again, or your significant other or somebody that you trust. And, and that's just the start, because a lot of times just talking about it does help. I will say all of these suggestions are the next phase, the fourth phase of the continuum, which is healing. So if you don't take steps to heal, it's probably not going to go away on its own. So whether that means you're calling a professional or you're doing something for yourself, keep in mind that once stuff starts going, I mean, I always think of it like, oh, things are getting a little haywire or a wackadoodle or something. It's going to, it's not going to fix itself. So one way or the other, you need to take some kind of action. And if you, if you move on through the continuum into healing, you end up in the fifth phase, which is healthy again. And so that's very much like what you were talking about. And you said something else, the antidepressants. So I think a lot of people are, are under the assumption that once you start taking antidepressants, it's like you're going to be on them your whole life. And from what I know about them, they're not intended for you to be on them your whole life. They are intended to help you through like the roughest patch while you're getting some kind of therapy or counseling to start addressing the underlying issue and then you wean off of them and you're fine again. So you're not being sentenced to a lifetime of taking antidepressants just because you may have depression right now. Yeah, and I would also encourage you that if you, unfortunately there are some doctors out there that might overprescribe. And mm -hmm. um, if you find yourself in that situation where you just don't feel like you need it anymore, but it's kind of being presented to you as something that's necessary, then have that discussion you know, or seek a new doctor. You don't always have to listen to just one doctor. If you're not sure that they're giving you the right information, get a second opinion. Well, I think it's just, you know, overall, and a lot of mindfulness is being aware of how to be healthy because you're aware of every little thing that's not feeling good. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you're kind of drawn to that whole sphere of, okay, what can I do to feel better? How can I be healthier? But for mental illness and and that includes mood disorders, anxiety, it can include depression, obviously, but it can also include schizophrenia or bipolar. Yeah. Um, there's just a wide array of mental illnesses that can greatly impact our lives. So if you already have one, then of course, hopefully you're getting help. And if not, I hope this helps prompt you to reach out for some help. But if you just start practicing a mindful way of living, 
you're going to automatically start recognizing that you do need to perhaps reach out. Eating healthy, getting exercise, making sure you have social connections, that they are more and more finding that that is one of our biggest health problems is not having a community or a group or our tribe or whatever you want to call it. That makes one of the biggest differences imaginable in your overall health, including your mental health. If you're aging, okay, we just talked about age two weeks ago. And I cannot stress enough that, especially now that we live longer, we don't know what our lifespan is really going to be. Don't assume just because you're in your 50s or 60s that having like a mental decline or a fogginess or a memory problem is just age. Don't do it. Just have a checkup because there are so many things that impact the brain. And of course, our brains decline over time. And so there are things that could be like, you know, say, for instance, dementia. It can't be cured, but it can be slowed down. But it can't be if you don't find out that that's the problem, that it's not yeah. just normal aging, normal wear and tear, so to speak. The other things included in preventative care would be being optimistic. Like just try being optimistic. So when you hear yourself looking at the negative side, see if you can flip it to something more optimistic. Because again, you're affecting your brain neuropathy. It's like, let's not constantly look at the negative. We need to reduce our stress, all of us do. And then another thing that helps is to have a strong sense of identity. And that's gonna mean probably something different for everyone. But for me, my identity is tied around understanding my purpose in life and making meaning of what I'm doing in life. That's like a core part of, to me, of who I am. So you can decide what's important to you about that. But when you have a strong sense of identity, not only does it boost your self-confidence, but it helps you be more aware. Remember I said, when you start feeling like, I don't feel like myself, you're gonna notice like, oh, that's not within my normal realm of my identity. And that'll help you maybe get help sooner. Yeah, I think too, if you have, maybe you could have a genetic mental issue or you could have something else that you're already getting treatment for uh, with either medication or therapist. There's nothing wrong with also using mindful tools in conjunction with that. It's only going to make it better. It's not going to make it worse. And for me, I think ever since I did have that issue way back when I was younger, I'm keenly aware because depression does run in my family. Uh, there are some other mental health issues in our family. And I'm keenly aware of my own mind. And because of mindfulness, I can stop it or treat it or, you know, try to work on it much quicker, I think, than I would be able to if I wasn't mindful, because yeah. I'm very aware of my body. I'm very aware of my mental health. And it's important to me because I do want to live a long time. I do want to enjoy life to its fullest. So I think that prioritizing mental health just as much as you would prioritize all of the other health aspects of your body is crucial. I do want to say... So there is absolutely no downside to mindfulness for anyone. There's nothing harmful about mindfulness. Meditation is slightly different. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are very specific meditations that help with, with your mental wellness, which include like the body scan, deep breathing exercises, things like that that are reducing stress. But about 12%, 12.5% of the population do not respond well to meditation. If you have a mental illness, a diagnosed mental illness, Talk to your, whoever's providing you professional care to make sure that it's safe for you. So the reason for that is in meditation, you can often go really inward. And if you, for instance, let's say, and I'm, and I'm not, I don't know medically about this, but I'm just going to use this as an example. Let's say it's with, if you have schizophrenia and you meditate and you're already hearing voices or noises, or it can make you more uh, hyper aware of those mm conditions and that could cause you distress so um if you also, have if you been, have like trauma you know if, if if your mental health is trauma related you really should seek trauma-informed care and meditation may not be a part of that because that could only trigger it or exacerbate it yeah and the last thing you want to do is re-traumatize yourself Correct, or traumatize. Yeah. um so yeah so there are definitely some cautions there with with meditation in general and especially mindfulness meditation you know, there are very simple meditations where you're really just breathing. You're not going deep into like a almost sort of trance area. That's what I think of it as. Um, but don't don't risk it if you're not sure. 
right. because you don't want to make yourself worse. We want, we want everyone to feel great. Um, but mindfulness, but which is different than yeah. related to meditation, but different. That's not going to do that. So no, I've never heard of anyone who eating healthy caused them a problem. <laughs> well, talk to my husband. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, then that's mental again, though, right? It's worth <laughs> reaching out in some way, whether it's to your own network or, you know, whether it's outside of that with groups that other people are experiencing this experiencing the same thing that can make a huge difference. And it can also perhaps help you decide, oh, do I need more? Or is this actually, I already feel some relief, so let me try this for a while. Yeah, and I mean, with the numbers of one in four adults yeah. having a diagnosable mental illness, obviously you are not alone. So exactly. there's a lot of people that are suffering, even if it's minor, it's only going to help you to seek yeah. out that care. Yeah, and I, the last thing I will say on this is, or I think it's the last thing I'll say, is that depression and anxiety have become such commonplace words you know, so, you know, I, and I've done it, I'll say, well, I'm feeling depressed, but I don't mean true, like major depression, like a mental illness. I'm, I'm basically saying I'm either sad or upset about something, right? And anxiety is almost like everybody's anxious. <laughs> but in fact, major depression and anxiety are both considered mental illnesses. And so I think it's um, almost 20% of the population suffers from anxiety now. And I don't mean anxious like momentarily. I mean, where you're anxious all the time. Um, that's a lot, 20% of the population. And it, we're like at 9% or something now suffer from major depression. That is millions and millions and millions of people. Wow. So again, being mindful when you, when you catch yourself using those words, whether it's to yourself or to somebody else, just take a pause and think through, is that really what I'm feeling? Because if it is, then you probably need to see a professional. And if, if you don't know, see a professional. Exactly. If you can't identify, see one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just check in very mindfully and without judgment and with a lot of self-compassion. Because when you don't feel good, it's, it can be scary. Um, and so, you, you know, again, that's part of why people don't reach out. That's another reason is they don't want to hear the news if it's something bad. So they just figure, oh, I'll just deal with it. It'll go away. So Avoid, um, avoid, avoid. Yeah. Yeah. So self-care, self-compassion, and mindfulness. All right. Well, I hope you found something interesting or useful in today's podcast. Uh, I hope you join us again next week. And I hope you really take care of your mental health and stay aware. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope, too, that if you are suffering or if you know someone who is suffering, you know, offer a helping hand. and you know, you can always just give some resources to somebody if you think they might be suffering. And yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful week and please head to our website. If you need more resources, we've got a lot there on mental health. So have a wonderful, wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to other great shows. Visit our website, amindfulmoment.com to access podcasts, scripts, and reading recommendations. A Mindful Moment is hosted by Teresa McKee and Melissa Sims. This podcast is produced by Work to Live Productions. Thank you for tuning in.